our last talk, talk for the uh, morning, it's um, again with uh, Dr. Tang. Uh, all the new updates on the transcatheter mitral valve uh, in valve and valve in ring and all the new evolutions that are happening in that area. So uh, given that I'm a cardiac surgeon, I could say, put a question mark at the end. It's like, is it the new standard or, or, or does the jury still out? Uh, so we're gonna switch gear to the mitral valve. Here's my disclosures. I actually have to give uh, credits to Dr. Mini Bapa, who's been doing a lot of partnering work in this area. So let's start with sur surgery. So this is a recent meta-analysis, look at the, the STS database in one part of the country, uh, looking at contemporary outcomes of reoperative mitral valve surgery. And you can see here, the volume of mit reop mitral valve surgery is also increasing in addition to some of these transcaptor mitral valve procedure. But also you can see here, the outcome is also safer. You can see the odds to O, o to E ratio, the observed expected ratio is also improved with time. However, you know, there is a significant mortality mobility. You can see the 30 mortality in this all commerce cohort is still around 11% with a stroke of 2.8%, and major mobility almost a third of the patients. And if you look at compare reop surgery or primary valve surgery, you still around an average $17,000 more. So clearly, this is still a unmet clinical need. If you look at the echocardiographic and clinical outcomes. This is a small series from Emory, looking at real mitral valve replacement of the mitral valve in valve. You can see here in the transcaptor mitral valve group, certainly these are sicker patients with high STS score, but they do stay sh uh, shorter in the ICU and in the hospital. There's less new uh, AFibs. You don't have to be on significant duration of Coumadin, but they do have slightly higher mitral valve gradient in a year. So why would we want to do mitral valve in valve for a transcaptor approach? Well, number one, it avoids a reoperation. And if the patient have a previous cabbage or AVL, you potentially you may have a more difficult surgical exposure to get back to the mitral valve. Well, sometimes with a previous mitral valve prosthesis, these prosthesis can be really stuck to the heart, and you don't want to excavate the old prosthesis with a big hole in the heart and have to reconstruct it afterwards. Certainly, it does reduce mobility, some stuff, recovery, and potential mortality. And if you have a transeptal approach, which is percutaneous, you instantaneously can achieve immediately hemodynamic improvement, and potentially you can send the patient home the next day rather than at least one to two weeks. But still, why would you want to do reop MVL? Well, certainly, if you have paraviral leak that you can't close percutaneously, well, you need to fix that because they often suffer from hemolysis and other morbidities associated with that. Or well, if you have an infective valve, you certainly can't do transcaptor approach. And certainly, uh, if you have risk of LVOT obstruction, even with mitral valve replacement, you need to think about how to treat that. Now, there might be some approaches to treat this percutaneously, but certainly you still probably need surgery. And finally, if the patient needs other surgeries, so cabbage, cuspid repair, or maize, certainly I think re-op surgery would be a reasonable approach. So this is a little outdated data, but this is what we have so far in terms of published data. Uh, looking at the transcaptor mitral valve in valve or valve in ring procedure, you can see here is certainly uh, rapidly expanding even at the time of 2015. And this is a, a re nice review published uh, with the Houston group here looking at TMVR for native and failed valve plastic mouth. I encourage you to read them at your leisure. So we need to look at some anatomy about the bioprosthetic valve. Certainly, you look at the label, you can see there's an X number of size, but this is the label size. But in reality, if it's a standard valve, the anatomy is actually a little bit smaller. So you can see here, that's the leaflet, the stand frame, and that's what we sew out the valve onto. And you can see the inner diameter is often different from the label size. So the lesson is that the exact internal diameter or dimensions of these surgical valves are actually what's relevant in mitral valve and valve procedures. In the case of most standard valves, we don't put in standards on the mitral position, these diameters are smaller. So I'll give you an example here, this is the CT scan, two of a valve and a ring. You can see here in a valve, the white is actually the uh, valve itself. You can see the inner diameter is different from the external diameter. You can see whether actually the sewing cuff is roughly right around here. In terms of ring, again, it's very similar. You have this, the sewing ring part of the ring, the fabric, but also you have the inner diameter, and that's what you have to calculate when you do these uh, procedures. But there are some caveats with CT sizing. So there's motion artifact, which can limit what you can measure. There's a booming artifact, which can light up more than what you expect. There's contrast washed out or shadowing that can, again, limit your sizing. Sometimes these rings are non-planar, so how do you actually calculate that? And also, some of them have lack of visible landmarks. So you can't really tell where the exact annulus is. Another modality you can look at is percept TEE. So we don't do that routinely, but certainly that's an option. However, you know, you have, it is operator dependent. You have to look at 2D versus 3D. 
there might be booming artifact with some of the shattering of the prosthesis, and you can underestimate the, the true diameter of these valves. So typically, the easy way is what Vini Bapa develops a valve in valve app you can download it on your on your smartphone. And you can see here, even though you can look at it, it's not that easy because each valve you can see here, like going to a candy store, is look quite different. And the implication is that depending on which valve it is, you may size them differently and also might position the transcaptor valve a little bit differently. So here's how the valve and valve app works. Just in the essence, you can see it gives you a list of valves. You pick one and you pick the size, and then it gives you the diameter of the internal diameter and also the height of the valve and also the true diameter, which is what really what you look at in comparison to the stent, and then give you a choice of valve that you can potentially put in. So here's an example. So example, this is a mosaic valve. You can see there's no analyst you can see, which makes, makes it difficult for CT to analyze it, but you do see these three eyelets, and this is kind of the recommended position where you're supposed to put the valve in. The concern is that if you put the valve too atrial, meaning too high up here, the valve can embolize, and if you're too deep, you might lead to LVOT obstruction or having the frame of the transcaptor valve interacting with the, with the ventricular septum. So the optimal sizing right now is still typically we oversize because we're concerned about migration embolization, but there was also some question about if you oversize too much, you might end up having a, a significant mitral gradient. So the question is, can you actually true size and maybe overexpand the sapient valve in, in order to achieve anchoring? And also, I think you need to consider whether the mechanism of failure is it mitral stenosis or regurgitation or it's mixed, because certainly with stenosis, you have bulkier leaflets, you might be able to have a better anchor. So these are early experiences. This is courtesy of mini valve. You can see here, this is a sapient XT valve implanted transapically in a mitral valve valve. Looks pretty good there. And then you can see that if you don't oversize adequately or if you don't overexpand, that's what can happen and pretty dramatic. Uh, on, 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 during the procedure. So you can see here this one as well. You can see this is, looks pretty good, you know, on deployment. And then three months later, the valve starts to shift more atrially because, again, you can see that the valve is pretty much laid in parallel to the, mitra, uh, to the, mit the surgical mitral valve. Now, it's a unique problem in the mitral position versus the aortic position. The reason is that there's much higher closing pressure. Now, most humans' diastolic pressure runs around between 60 to 80 or 90, but you know, the systolic pressure in the ventricle is going to be up to 200. So you can imagine if you're in a parallel kind of deployment, you can see here, this is an ex extractor valve, the valve can migrate and you can embolize if, even if you oversize adequately. Compared to if you have a more current generation, the sapient free valve, you can see it flares a bit on the, on the ventricular side. And you can see here, it gives a little bit more stable in deployment and implant. Now, the other question is, does orientation of these valves matter? And the question is that if these valves, the commissural poles, which you see under x-ray here, are aligned with the sapient free commissural poles, you might have issue with the frame not able to expand as much as you, you would like to because you have the commissural post here uh, resisting your expansion versus if you actually misalign intentionally with the commissural post space in the leaflets instead because the leaflets are more compliant, you might be able to get a bare flaring effect. So in terms of mitral valve ring, ring is a bit more challenging because the valves you can see very well and it's a fixed structure, but rings you can see that it can come with various anatomical features. You can see they can be a complete, incomplete, or just bands. It can be rigid, semi-rigid, or flexible. And the radial opacity, meaning can you see it under fluoroscopy, can vary from being nothing, you can't see anything, or quite good, and the range of sizes are quite variable. So here are the four properties we typically value for mitral valve and ring feasibility. So one, can they become circularized? Because a lot of these rings are in, in odd shapes and, uh, and shapes. Can it provide a good anchor? Because unlike a surgical valve, you don't have much to anchor other than the ring itself. And also, can you see where you're going to putting it in and is the size appropriate? So here's an example of a semi-rigid ring. Okay, this is, of course, Soren Memo 3D. You can see here, this is a bench model. Look, and if you deploy a sapient free valve, you can reasonably circularize this. It's not perfect, but certainly it's, a, it's better than being deformed. And you can see here that some of these valves, though, with smaller diameter might be more rigid because, again, with semi-rigid, the larger, the more radial force you can put on. But also, at the same time, once you deploy this, you might want to progress, uh, more aggressively post-dilate these, these rings so that you maintain the anchor and also um, attempt to circularize it more. <laughs> 
You can see this is an example of rigid ring. You can see this is a rigid saddle ring. Again, you can see here, this is quite deformed. And the question is, can you achieve uh, number one uh, durability with these valves inside such a deformed uh, configuration? And two, whether you might have paraviral leak on either side because of the rigidity of the ring. So the implications of the ring type on the anchor is important. So in terms of rigid ring, you can certainly achieve a good anchor, but you run the risk of paraviral leak. The semi-rigid ring are likely the most uh, suitable candidates. The flexible complete rings are borderline because they're flexible, they can certainly embolize because they can stretch. And if you in have an incomplete ring or band router, certainly it will not securely anchor. So these are some of the ideal rings for mitral valve ring terms. So these are typically more semi-rigid. I will not uh, discuss them in detail. But this is the app. This is also the mitral valve ring valve that you can use. You go pick the ring and they'll tell you basically what the commissure, commissure dimensions and the septal lateral dimension is. And this is, and also give you an area. But really what we're trying to do is look at the perimeter because when this valve, uh, sorry, when this ring circularizes, your area is going to expand. So that's going to be, you need a, what we call projected area or you actually see how this circumference or the perimeter of the ring will expand to accommodate the valve. And I think that's what we need to do next rather than just looking at area-based sizing. Now there's a, co a common unique theme here called LVOT obstruction, left ventricular alpha trap obstruction in mitral valve, transcaptor mitral valve therapy. And the mechanism is that you still have the anterior leaflet preserved, at least certainly in the repair patients, that if you put a valve and ring in there, the anterior leaflet will swing like a trap door into the LVOT and can obstruct the outflow. So even though you can, it's almost like a systolic anterior motion or SAM phenomenon that's observed after mitral valve repair. And also another issue is that the infolding, if the anterior leaflet is tall, you can see here in systole, it can obstruct the inflow and you can compromise potentially the sapien free or transcaptor valve function. And finally, the third point is we talked about is the risk of migration. So certainly there are ways to predict the LVOT obstruction risk. You can look at TEE, you can look at transthoracic echo, but really CT is what we look at right now. You can see here depending on the anatomy of the valve inside the ventricle, depending on how flare out is in the ventricle, depending on the aortal mitral angle, which is how steep this angle is between the mitral annulus and the aortic annulus, and also whether you have a septal bulge as a patient with Holcomb or in this patient with septal hypertrophy, you can certainly have an increased risk of LVOT obstruction. Now it also depends on the valve type. You can see at the top is a porcine valve, which you can see here the leaflets upon expansion doesn't go all the way down to the bottom of the commissure post. So if you're a little bit more opening uh, than you expect, certainly this is hard to model because the mechanism of failure are different between, uh, in, among the different valves. But certainly porcine valve typically more favorable than bovine valve, which is all the way down to the bottom of the commissure post. This is an emerging technique called Lampoon technique, uh, which is sponsored by the NIH trial. It's been done now in a, a separate clinical trial in humans. Is that essentially what they're trying to do is to do an electrical surgery and put in catheters to encircle the anterior leaflet and basically split it in half to able to make an opening to improve the left ventricular outflow rather than having a curtain effect with the anterior mitral leaflet. And certainly this might become one of the important tools as it become refined in transcaptor mitral valve replacement therapy. In terms of getting to the mitral valve, the three approaches, transeptal is certainly the least invasive because it's transfemoral, that's transapical, and also you can directly implant the valve itself transatrially. In terms of the transeptal mitral valve in valve, there's certainly a step-by-step -step review that's been published here. There's a lot of steps involved, but I think one of the most important things is the transeptal puncture, which is essential in terms of location on any transcaptor mitral valve therapy. So unlike the standard mitral clip, where we typically go a little bit more su uh, superior middle of the fossa on the bicaval view, you want to be a little bit more inferior and posterior so that you have a more direct shot and the mitral valve. And you can see here, typically, unlike the mitral clip where you want at least four centimeters of height, here it's a little bit lower so you can get closer to the mitral valve to avoid any kind of boomerang effect. So you can see here the railing of the wire typically is, if you do a more inferior puncture, it's more direct shot towards the mitral valve in, in placing the stiff wire in the left ventricle. You can see here this is the optimal bio trajectory. Otherwise, you might end up looping around the left atrium and coming down, which would make the positioning much more difficult. We talked about residual gradients after valve in valve being a little bit high than surgical re mitral replacement. You can see here, if you look at this uh, study from Danny DeVere TV uh, the registry, 
from a vivid registry, you can see here a portion of these patients, particularly if the internal diameter of the surgical mitral valve is less than 25, or around 24 or less, you can have a, a minority of patients with an elevated gradient. And also, if you see here, smaller surgical valve, just like prosthesis patient mismatch in tavern and in surgical aortic valve, you can see smaller mitral valve can lead to mitral gradients as well. And remember, because this is the mitral position, they can be uh, less well tolerated. So I'm going to show you some data of mitral valve in valve and valve in ring. Certainly, this is one of the early uh, pre data from the TBT registry. You can see over 600 patients in valve in valve, 100 patients for valve in ring. In terms of the patient characteristics, you see the relatively high STS score, you know, an average of 10, 9 to 10 on both groups. You can see a bunch of different valves and rings that have been implanted. And you can see here in terms of the gradients, in the pre-op gradient, you can see these are patients with Christenotic valves, uh, even in the native valves after mitral repair, up, up to uh, over 50% of them. And you can see here also a significant number of them, moderate, severe, or greater MR. You can see here, uh, right, right now, at least in the early experience, transeptal and transapical roughly split in terms of uh, this population. However, you can see here the mortality is still, you know, the valve in mouse are quite good at 6.8%, but the valve range is certainly a bit higher at 9.3% uh, in hospital, and mortality at 30 days is still quite high. If you look at the valve in ring data, certainly we talked about the limitation of this procedure is that some of them still needs a second valve and re-intervention. And you can see it despite fixing the, the uh, stenosis or regurgitation, you can see here the moderate to severe MR is still around 9 to 10 percent, and also moderate to severe PVL. So certainly, this is not uh, a perfect procedure. There's also risk of embolization, LVOT obstruction involving ring, reintervention or, uh, re or surgery, and also bleeding and blood transfusion. Embolization, like I said before, can, be, can, be, can still happen. You can see 4% of patients require an embolization. But also, you can see here about 30% of them are still a mild or greater residual MR involving brain group. So certainly, uh, this is still an unsolved uh, clinical need. You can see this is another large uh, uh, multi-center registry looking at valve in valve versus valve in ring. You can see here all cause mortality is higher in valve in ring group compared to the valve in valve group. You can see also consistently this need for second valve in valve in ring compared to the valve in valve. You can see here more moderate uh, or greater M residual MR in valve in ring group. And also mortality is still numerically higher uh, and a lower procedural success in the valve in ring group. Now, what about valve thrombosis? These patients typically get anticoagulated for at least three months, just like what we do in surgical valve. But you can see here, the, in terms of compared to in the transcaptal valve in valve group, the overall is about 10 patients in this cohort that was presented at ESC in this registry. And if you have valve thrombosis, and, you, uh, and typically the patients who don't get uh, anticoagulation had a high incidence of valve thrombosis. And in terms of the overall comparative outcome in the valve in range, certainly I think we're doing better. You can see here in terms of comparing in hospital versus 30 day mortality, it's still quite high, but in the mitral trial, which is a controls uh, single arm trial, it's certainly uh, better through careful patient selection. And if you look at the residual MR after the valve in range, again, certainly it's still quite high. So I think there's still more uh, to learn from this procedure and what we can do to overcome this. Certainly, there are now uh, transcaptor mitral valve replacements, such as the tendine valve that's been used in the failed mitral ring that has been worked out quite well. But certainly, uh, patient screening is still an issue because you can't put them in two rings that are too small. But I just want to uh, finish with this particular paper from our group saying, you know, if you're in a reference center, re repairing the mitral valve is still a good strategy, uh, both for early or, or late failure mitral valve repair. At least in a small series, you can see a still very good success rate, 85%, with zero in, in hospital mortality, 97% four year survival, certainly better than the valve in ring group, and freedom of modern ML, 80% at four years. Now, of course, this is a highly selective patients. These are not. STS score of 10 to 12 percent, but certainly if they're operable, I think it's reasonable to attempt reoperative surgery. You can see here, these are the technical um, sorry, modes of failure, ranging from progression of native disease to technical failure to new disease. And you can see the number of techniques here that you can re-repair mitral valve beyond just the primary repair strategy.
So the take-home message in summary is that mitral valve and valve is a, is a less invasive alternative to re mitral valve replacement, and I think it's becoming a new standard. Direct mitral valve and valve actually combined with other surgical procedures can actually simplify a complex, uh, a complex operation. So rather than excavating the previous mitral valve, you can just put a safe in free directly, and then you can do your other uh, combined procedures such as a cabbage or tricuspid repair or maze. However, pre-case planning is still critical to eva evaluate the valve size and LVOT obstruction risk. Valve and ring is feasible in select complete annuloplasty rings, as I mentioned before, but it's still limited to certain high or extreme risk patients. However, because of late valve migration and embolization, residual MR and mortality, I think you still need to wait and see before making this a mainstream procedure. And I think in operable patients, repair can be done in mitral reference center with excellent outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gilbert. Um, we are not bad at all, so uh, and we are going to have a lunch break until 1.15 with Dr. A little giving us a little talk in between there. Um, so we can take a few minutes for questions. Um, any, any questions to any of the speakers in the second half that you may want to bring in? Anybody? Dr. Little. So far, they worked out okay, but I know there's a concern about maybe long-term migration if you don't have that anterior anchor. So, have you? Had yeah, some we experience? we've been very selective. You know, certainly we have centered that Dr. Adams repair most of the, we repair most of these, so we don't see them. Uh, the issue is the long anterior leaf and the LVOT obstruction. So even though anatomically they are favorable, we are not part of the Lampoon trial, so we don't really have ways to address that. So that's the issue. Uh, so if the gradient is acceptable, if the primary mechanism is the ML, we can try to you know, do mitral clip in these patients. But certainly, again, some of them have really small rings, so we can't really do much offer except surgery, unfortunately. Yeah. Can you give the mic to Mike Riordan? So Mike, I was going to ask you, your presentation was fantastic in terms of the future. Wow. I mean, it's like now we're going to soon have 20 of these valves to choose from. That will bring price down by competition, which is a good thing. But it's going to be tough for surgeons. Then, How do surgeons will decide, let's say, you know, three or four years from now, which one to pick from the shelf? I mean, uh, at a point, you're going to have so many of them. It's like, OK. <laughs> well, there's more surgical valves than, than what you, than tower valves are. Yes, I know that. And so what surgeons do is they, they end up choosing one or two of each valve type. So when you look at TAVR valves, there are three fundamental designs. There's a balloon expandable valve at one end, there's a self-expanding valve at the other end, and there's a mechanically expanded valve in the middle. And, you know, and, and I think what's going to happen is you're going to kind of choose one in each category, mm -hmm. maybe two in the self-expanding, because that's where it's growing. And, yeah. and, 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 and your team will then you know, use those. You know, the problem, of course, coming to market is it took the first two valves, Edwards and Medtronic, about a billion dollars each to bring their valves to market. Yes. And each of these new valves is going to have a hard time coming to market uh, as the potential for return on investment drops. Yeah. So although there's a lot of them there, I don't anticipate the majority of those making it to market. Somebody will buy their intellectual property and some big company and keeps the others from developing it. That's an interesting concept, yeah. I think, I think the other point is that it's not like a PCI where you can, you know, it's, the learning curve is pretty, pretty uh, low. I mean, these valves, I mean, you know, Mike has done all of them and each of them takes a different skill set to learn to get good at them. And so I think for the smaller programs, it's gonna be hard to justify. And the hospital administration will not allow you. They won't allow it. Thank you. <laughs>